OK, so that's the first of the three stories in Aventura dealt with. Now we get the idea and hopefully realise that the knowledge required to do it was all stuff we knew already, there was nothing really complicated in there, and that it's all about technique. Let's take a look at the second story and take it in the same basic way. So, the chief executive of Aventura. So this is the person who runs the company. So pretty senior, about the second most senior person at the company under the chairman. Armando Tiolo owns a private jet. Well, lucky Armando. Armando invoices the company on a monthly basis for that proportion of the operating costs which reflects business use. Now, remember what the question said. Discuss the ethical issues raised. It doesn't say the ethical issues raised with the auditors. It just says the ethical issues raised. Is this an ethical issue with Armando? He's using his own personal asset, and an expensive one at that, for business use, and then recharging that to the company. Is that a problem? Well, if you used your own car to go on a business trip, you'd expect the petrol to be paid for, wouldn't you? And presumably, you would hope that it's not just the petrol costs you're reclaiming, but there's some element of reclaim as well for the wear and tear and gradual ageing of your car. So the answer would seem to be, in general, if we use our own private assets for business use, we'd expect to charge that back to the company. So whilst this is a fairly extreme personal asset, a private jet presumably costing several hundred thousand dollars, possibly a couple of million at least, as long as what he's doing is genuine business use, and that's the only thing he's charging back, and as long as the other directors are comfortable with this and have agreed it, really there's nothing wrong with it. One of these invoices, so one of the invoices he is recharging, therefore one of the invoices which should be for business use, don't forget that, shows that Darius Harkin, the audit manager, was flown to Florida in September 2007 and flown back two weeks later. Hmm. Why would someone fly to Florida for two weeks? Could be business. Two weeks sounds a bit like a holiday. Florida is a bit of a holiday destination. I mean, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but could it be that the client lets the audit manager take a ride in his private jet to go on holiday? That doesn't sound good, does it? Neither Aventura nor Verst have any offices or associates in Florida, which would appear to be telling us this is not a business trip. Now, we don't know for sure, but my first assumption from all of this is that the audit manager has taken a very nice gift, piece of generosity, hospitality, whatever, from the client. And unlike the first story which this is quite similar to if you think about it. Unlike the first story, the audit manager is rather more senior than the trainees who attend a stock take. So this is pretty serious stuff. And being an audit manager, you'd expect that Darius is qualified and therefore should know that this is not acceptable. This is not about retraining. If this is as bad as it looks, this could be Darius being sacked. Now... The fact that someone who is a qualified member of the ACCA, which I'm assuming Darius is, is doing this, means that you can't just sack them. We'll probably have to report him to the ACCA, because this is serious stuff. But, again, we're jumping ahead. Let's remember our answer needs a bit of structure to it. Highlight the ethical issues, which are pretty straightforward. Again, it's like the first one. Threats to objectivity... Self-interest, potentially intimidation, and familiarity. Because if I had a private jet, <laughs> I wish, I very much doubt I'd be letting everybody have a free ride on it. Second issue, seniority of Darius. He's senior. And of course, it looks like he's probably been offered this directly by Armando, who is also senior at the company. This is really worrying stuff. In fact, 
you have to start to question the ethics of Armando in, number one, doing something that looks so blatantly like bribing the auditors, and number two, don't forget, he's recharged this to the company. Is bribing the auditors a business expense? Some of you might think it's a perfectly sensible business expense. But I rather suspect that at the very least, this is not tax allowable. Because at the very least, this is probably seen as criminal activity. Bribing your auditors. So I'm starting now to question the ethics of my audit manager. And I'm also starting to question the ethics of the client. Now the third issue I said we should look at are the dates. So let's go back to our little timeline and just look at the dates involved here. This flight was taken in September 2007. That's over a year ago. Now the stock take was bad enough, that was five months ago. But this is 15 months ago. Just think of all the stuff Darius could have done since then that affects this client. And if this was done more than a year ago, and we are currently doing this year's audit, there's a pretty strong chance that last December we were doing last year's audit. And Darius was probably the manager. And three months earlier, he'd been on a nice free plane ride to Florida. This does not just affect this year's audit. I'm now starting to worry about the quality of last year's audit. And that's a big problem, because that is finished, signed off, and the shareholders saw the audit report. In other words, it's too late to solve that problem. Now, of course, it's taken us so long to spot this, because... The flight was invoiced back to the company, so it's been spotted during this year's audit of the last accounting year's expenditure. This is one of the problems with auditing. By the time you spot a problem, it might be too late to do anything about it. Right. Well, we know what the matters are. I'm not going to write them out in full. We did that for the first answer. But let's just make a note of what we've come up with so far. So, we have objectivity threats, as with the first story. Second problem, Darius, audit manager, senior, that makes this critical. There's Armando and his ethics. And then there's the date. Now, of course, in mentioning the date, I suppose since we've had September 2008, since September 2007, if Darius likes the idea of an annual holiday in Florida, for all we know, he might have been again. It may be on next year's audit we're going to find another invoice. So, all sorts of problems in here. Time to decide what we do about them.
Now let's face it, this isn't looking good, is it? But it would be a good idea to give Darius a chance to explain in case there are mitigating circumstances, although that would seem unlikely. I mean, I suppose it is possible that when Darius was offered this, he said, well, I can't possibly accept unless you let me pay for the cost of using your private jet. If he's paid the full price of the flights, has he had any benefit? Probably not. But that seems fairly unlikely because the costs of the flight have been claimed back from the company by Armando. If Darius had already paid Armando for the flight, why would he be claiming them back unless he's a real crook? So it seems to me that this is probably an open and shut case and that Darius, when we talk to him, will probably realise that the game is up. We need to get Darius off the audit team. Any work he's done so far on this year's audit, well, we'll have to check that again, and we can't let him have any more input. This is too big a present. And in fact, we won't just take him off the audit team, there's a pretty strong chance we'll be walking him out of the building and sacking him, and then reporting him to the ACCA. OK, assuming this is bad, we've now got Darius out of the equation. The rest of the audit process could carry on, but we need to get another manager onto the team, possibly a couple of managers, because someone's got to finish the audit and someone's got to go back and check everything that Darius has been involved in. And being the audit manager, you could argue he has an effect on everything. Again, we might have to suggest redoing bits of the audit. And of course, the audit's almost finished, so this could be a big job. Bearing in mind the impact that Darius has on the audit, and bearing in mind we are now fairly concerned about the behaviour of Armando, the client, you might even decide that the best solution in this case is to stop the audit now, resign, and let another firm do it. So there we go. The second question is relatively similar to the first part of the question, the main differences being the dates involved and the seniority of the staff. Time now to move on to the third and final bit of the question. Last week, Armando announced his engagement to be married to his personal assistant, Kirsten Fennimore. Well, congratulations to them. Can't really see why this would affect the auditors, but fantastic. Before joining Aventura in March 2008, so that's about three months before their year end, Kirsten had been Verst's accountant in charge of the audit of Aventura. Right. So Kirsten used to work for our audit firm and audited this client. Accountant in charge is not as senior as manager or partner, but it's more senior than trainee. It's sort of in the middle somewhere of the team. So she has some seniority. And then she joined the client. And then she became engaged to the chief executive. Hmm. Tricky one. Um, well, I suppose we should try to attack this in the same way we've done the other two. Can we see some ethical issues? How senior is Kirsten, which is sort of medium, and let's look at the dates involved to see if that's relevant. Once we've done that, we can consider the action we need to take.
Okay, ethical issues. Can Kirsten leave our firm and join a client? Well, as long as her contract doesn't stop her from doing that, and some audit firms try to stop audit staff joining clients because they realise it may cause problems, as long as there's nothing in her contract, she's free to do it. And given that she did it nine months ago, presumably we'd have complained by now if there was a problem. So there's no obvious issue there. Is she allowed to become engaged to the chief executive of Aventura? Well, of course, Kirsten can get married with whoever she wishes. There's nothing we can do about that. Although, amazingly, on exam day, some students decided there was. Worrying. So, she can join the client and she can get married to whoever she likes. So, what is the issue here? Has Kirsten actually done anything wrong? Well, potentially, she's done nothing wrong. But... Maybe she has. I wonder what happened. Did Kirsten audit Aventura once or twice? Think what a great looking company. Maybe she decided she wanted to leave our firm. Aventura had a job going, so she had the job there. And then, as personal assistant to Armando, she realised what a lovely guy he was, and she liked the idea of the private jet, no doubt, and, oh look, they have got engaged. Maybe that's what happened. Or maybe Kirsten and Armando had been seeing each other for ages before she left. And the reason she left to go and work with him was because they were already seeing each other. And if that's the case, maybe some of the work that she's done in the past on this client could have been affected. But the problem with this is that if we assume they were seeing each other before she left, she could have been seeing him for years, which could mean several audits in a row have been affected. I think the key issue here is actually not Kirsten. The issue here is the rest of the current audit team, who presumably all know Kirsten because up until nine months ago they were working with her. The issue here could actually be the familiarity of the other audit staff still at our firm with Kirsten, and that could affect the entire audit team. It could affect everybody in our office. It could mean we can't create an audit team of people who don't know Kirsten. Now, Kirsten has not gone to become the finance director of Aventura. She's the personal assistant to the chief executive. The problem is, as personal assistant, she's going to be fairly close to one of the most senior people at the company. And given that she's going to get married at some point to him, she's very close. I mean, bear this thought in mind. When they get married, there's every chance that some of our audit staff get invited to the wedding. Now, that's pretty familiar, isn't it? Hmm. So, the issues. There's a familiarity threat involving probably everyone in our office. Now, if this is a very big firm of accountants and auditors, there may well be people who never had any contact with Kirsten who could now do the audit. If we're a big firm, maybe we have another office in another part of the country who could send some staff down, people who had never met Kirsten. But if we're not a big firm, we may now have a real problem staffing this audit with independent people. As accountant in charge, or AIC, there is a level of seniority here, so this is something we need to think about. And then we think about the dates.
She did, at least, leave before this year's audit, or final audit at least, started. So in that respect, she cannot have done any direct damage on the final audit. But of course, the other staff, who know Kirsten, may have done. And as I said, maybe worth putting in the answer, if she was seeing Armando before she left our firm, previous audits may have been affected. It might not just be last year's, of course. They might have been dating for years. OK, well, those would appear to be the issues. What about the actions we can take? Well, the big issue here is can we carry on with the audit given that all of the staff on the team may be too close to Kirsten and therefore Armando. We may have to consider replacing the entire audit team and we may not be able to do that because we may not have any staff who didn't know Kirsten. And if that's the case, we may have little option but to stop and resign. Now, please note, there is nothing we can do regarding Kirsten. She doesn't work for the firm anymore, so please don't talk about sacking her. And as far as I can tell from what I'm told, she's not actually done anything wrong. So you can't report her, and you can't write to her and start telling her, don't marry Armando, and don't do this and don't do that. I suppose you might want to remind her of her responsibilities regarding confidentiality of your audit process, maybe. But realistically, if she's going to tell Armando stuff, she's going to have told him already. So I doubt that would achieve much. The main issue here is about your other staff and trying to work out if there is anything we can do to staff this year's audit team with people who are independent. If there is any evidence suggesting that maybe she was seeing Armando in the past before she left, it may be worth reviewing previous audit work that she's done on this client. But there's no evidence in the question this has been happening, and I'm almost starting to make up the story to create more of an answer. So I'd only put that in if I was short on points. OK, let's just stop with this question. Now notice that on the first two stories we've come up with quite a lot and on the third story we've had to work a bit harder to come up with ideas. Well, you'd expect some aspects of questions to be tougher than others so there's no great surprise there. Also notice how having a framework to come up with ideas made it a lot easier to generate mark-earning points. When it comes to ethics questions, identify the issues, may need to look at the seniority of the people involved, you may need to look at dates. When it comes to actions, deal with the people involved, deal with the audit process, and then try to make sure this never happens again, if you can. And that might involve some retraining of staff. OK. Well, there's an ethics question, and hopefully, having gone through that, you can see that as long as you have that little format for an answer... The actual question itself is not that difficult and we've managed to get through it without talking about the rules and the knowledge required at all. 
And that, of course, is because you've got that knowledge already from F8. It's just the situations on this exam are made a bit more difficult. Is every ethics question in that style? Is every ethics question sort of as easy as that? Because that didn't seem too bad, did it? Well, of course, some questions are harder. And to give you an appropriate balance, what we need to do now is move on to a second question where things are a bit tougher. So what we're going to do is look at a second question, this time from the very next exam paper, back in June 2002, where life has been made a bit tougher, in that, one, it's not split into three nice little stories, it's one big thing, and two, there are no dates mentioned, the seniority of staff is not going to help, and we're going to have to work a bit harder to work out what the issues are. Now, when we look at this question, always remember that if there is any way you can break the problem down into little bite-sized chunks, the better. In the question we just did, we used dates, we used seniority, etc. If you can't do that, look for any other way of breaking things down. And don't forget, with ethics being about behaviour, and therefore people, if you've got several people mentioned in a question, maybe the best route is to break it down and look at each individual person's behaviour separately. So, let's move on to the second question, a question called Corundum from June 2002. OK. As always, first, let's look at the requirement. And this says, identify and discuss the ethical and other professional issues relating to the above matters. It says, assume it is the 11th of December 2008 again, there might be some help with dates as far as understanding the situation, but I doubt in this question it will actually help the answer. Ethical and other professional issues. Now, you might try to break the answer up between ethical and other professional. But to be honest, the phrase other professional issues is such a general phrase, it doesn't really have a meaning. It's just anything you think is important. So I suspect, given that ethics itself is not a desperately well-defined word, that we just look at everything that we think is an issue. 15 marks again suggests we're looking to say 15 things. And immediately we look at the story, we can see it's not broken into little chunks. So let's have a read through and see if there's a way of breaking this down. Since we're talking primarily about behaviour and the way things are happening... Whenever we see something happening, let's stop and ask ourselves, is that right? And if we don't think it's right, what should or could have happened instead? OK, here we go. The audit of the financial statements of Corundum Limited for the year ended 30th of June 2008 is nearing completion. And the company's AGM, Annual General Meeting, is to be held next week. So the audit is very much near its completion, and next week, the audited accounts will be put in front of the shareholders, the members, if you like, to be authorised. Now, that's telling us that we are so close to finishing this, and the AGM is so close, that if there's a problem about to happen, we may have problems getting that problem dealt with quickly enough. Right. The current audit firm, SCARN, has not sought to be reappointed. OK, well, there's a fact, so let's make sure we understand it. Not sought to be reappointed. What does that mean? Well, as an audit firm, there are three ways that you can leave your client. You can resign and walk away today. Your client can get rid of you today. They can remove you, sack you. Or you can wait, finish this year's audit... And then when they say, we'd like you to do next year's, can we put you up at the AGM and have the shareholders vote? You say, thanks, but no thanks. I'll finish this year's, but find another firm for next year. That is known as not seeking reappointment. So that's what's happened then. SCARN are going to finish this year's audit, and then another firm will be invited to do next year's. Why? Well, apparently, it is Corundum's policy to change auditors periodically. 
Now, why might they do that? Change auditors every few years. Well, the answer is we don't know why they choose to do it. But if that's their policy, they always do it, in other words, it suggests that the reason is most likely to be that they're trying to make sure that the independence, the objectivity of their auditors is maintained. Now, that's a good thing, isn't it? And it's to do with ethics. And the question says ethical issues. Now, naturally, in an exam, we're looking to find problems. But if you find something positive, put it in the answer. So, slightly odd in that the first thing we've spotted is actually a good ethical issue. But the question doesn't say ethical problems, it says ethical issues. This is an issue, but a good one. So why not put it in the answer? OK, so SCARN are going to leave after this year's audit. Nui Ardente, a firm of chartered certified accountants, has accepted nomination as auditor for the year ending 30th of June 2009. Accepting nomination means they've said, yes, we're happy for you to put us on the AGM and have the shareholders vote. If the shareholders say yes, Nui Ardente become the auditors. So they're not the auditors yet. They've just said, yes, let the shareholders vote. But if they've accepted nomination, this should mean that Nui have gone through the process you have to go through before you say yes. Which means Newey should have considered things like, have they got the staff and other resources to do this audit? Have they got the competence to do the audit? Are there any conflicts of interest with their existing client base? Are they objective? Independent, in other words. Do they trust this company? Do they believe the directors of Corundum have integrity, for want of a better word. And, of course, it means they should have gone through a process called professional clearance, where the incoming firm ask the company for permission to write to the outgoing firm to ask if there are any issues they should be aware of before they decide to say yes or no. Now, this process is known by a number of names, professional clearance, professional etiquette. It has various names, as I said, but that process should have happened. Now, we haven't read the rest of the story yet. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, but just keep that thought in mind. If they've said yes, they, have, should, have, they should have investigated this client and gone through that process of clearance before saying yes. It has just come to light that a provision which should have been made in the financial statements for the year ended 30th of June 2008 has been omitted in error. Oh dear, the accounts are wrong. This is of such significance that the financial statements which are soon to be issued cannot be considered to be reliable. I think what we're basically being told here is that this is a material mistake. The accounts are wrong. However, the financial statements have been approved through the company's internal processes and the directors do not propose to amend them at this late stage. So the accounts are wrong, but the directors are going to send them to the shareholders anyway and then presumably get them authorised at the AGM next week. Well, that's an ethical issue, isn't it? Directors willing to give their shareholders the wrong accounts and knowingly the wrong accounts and let them vote on them anyway, that can't be right. But don't worry about it, because the auditors will surely issue an audit report that says the accounts are not true and fair. So problem solved. But we'll not agree to a modified auditor's report. What does that mean? It means that SCARN presumably have said, well, if you don't change it, we'll have to qualify your audit report. And the directors have said, no. 
This sounds like the directors putting pressure on the auditors to issue the wrong audit report. Not to worry. The auditors, of course, will show good moral fibre and will say, tough, if the accounts are wrong, that's the audit report you get. Scarn has discussed the matter with Newey. Well, they should do, shouldn't they? Newey should have contacted them, professional clearance, and Scarn should have let Newey know that the directors are not exactly the most ethical people in the world. And obtained verbal assurances that if Scarn were to sign an unmodified report, what? Scarn appear to be willing to issue the wrong audit report. They're lying to the shareholders. Well, that's clearly an ethical issue. And what's this verbal assurances from Newey? The comparative information in the financial statements for next year would not be restated. OK, let's just stop and work out what's going on here. The accounts are wrong. The directors know it, the auditors know it. Presumably, because it's so close to the AGM, the directors don't want to change the accounts and have told the auditors to keep quiet about it. The auditors, SCARN, have realised that if they say nothing and pretend that provision shouldn't be there, when the auditors change next year, the new firm are probably going to spot the mistake and a mistake in last year's figures means a prior period adjustment would need to be done. If the new firm insists on a prior period adjustment, someone is bound to ask the question, why did last year's auditors not spot the mistake? Why did the directors get it wrong? SCARN, worried that people will criticise them for issuing the wrong audit report, have had a quiet word with the new auditors and said, please don't find that mistake, please ignore it. And amazingly, they've received verbal assurances which means Newey have said yes to this. What are we going to say in our answer? The directors are liars. Scarn are liars. And Newey are willing to go along with this. So they're liars too. 15 marks is a lot for what we've read so far, but if we break this down into the directors, Scarn, Newey, and for each one, point out what is wrong with what they're doing, and then explain what they should have done, hopefully we'll get enough points to get us fairly close to 50% of 15 marks, and there's still another paragraph I noticed to read. Let's deal with what we've seen so far. The next paragraph is on something completely different, so we can treat that as a separate part of the answer. So, the directors, what are they doing wrong? Number one, they're issuing a set of accounts that is wrong. Number two, they're putting pressure on the auditors not to mention this, which is intimidation, which is also unethical. So we have two bits of unethical behaviour there. Well, that's what they've done, which we don't like. What should the directors do? Well, either they have to accept that the accounts need to be changed, and that might mean delaying the AGM to get the changes put through and the accounts printed up in time, or issue the wrong accounts and accept that the auditors are going to issue an audit report that has a qualification in it.
So that's the directors dealt with. We've managed to break that up into what appears to be possibly four marks worth of answer. Not entirely sure that would get a full four marks if we explain all of that, but that could be seen as four separate points. Let's now look at SCARN. What don't we like about what they're doing? Number one, they're issuing the wrong audit report. Number two, they're allowing the directors to intimidate them. Not showing moral courage, if you like, failing to stand up to a client who is clearly unethical. Number three, when the new incoming auditors have contacted them, instead of just giving them the information, they have tried to intimidate the new, for new firm, persuade them to also lie. And fourthly, if you were SCARN in this situation, what should you have done? And I suspect the answer is resign. If you've got a client who's pushing you around, you shouldn't even finish this year's audit. You should resign. So notice, if we just try and break the situation down in any way we can, it's a lot easier to get marks. The danger with a story like this is you read the whole thing through and then start writing in general terms about how everyone's being a bit naughty and really they shouldn't be. You've got to come up with specific individual points. Finally, Newey. So what have Newey done? They are also agreeing to issue the wrong audit report, which is, of course, unethical. They have at least gone through the professional clearance process, so they are following the right process, if you like, but their willingness to say yes and notice verbal assurances, they're not documenting this professional clearance process properly, although given that they're being unethical, you can understand why they don't want it written down, so, failure to document the process, willing to lie to protect the other firm of auditors. Why are they willing to do this, I don't know. So, Newey aren't exactly being the most ethical firm themselves. What should Newey do? Well, if you are going to carry on with this new client of yours, if you come in and find that last year's accounts are wrong, you should insist on a prior period adjustment or you'll be qualifying next year's audit report. But I suspect there's a different answer as well. Given the unethical behaviour of this client, when you find out from SCARN what's going on, SCARN, of course, should resign, and you should take back your acceptance of nomination. The directors of Corundum are showing a lack of integrity, and on that basis, you shouldn't have said yes. You should get out of there just like SCARN should.
And one more thing. Newey are being given a very clear indication that another firm of auditors, SCARN, are behaving in an unethical way. Newey should not just walk away from this situation and decide to have nothing to do with it. Given what they know, Newey should probably report SCARN to the ACCA for their unethical behaviour. So, clearly this question is not as straightforward as the previous one. We have to work hard to break it up to get enough mark-generating points. But by breaking it up person by person and saying, this is what they've done that I don't like, this is what they should have done, we've actually got in excess of ten separate points up on there. So hopefully we've passed this question already, which is just as well because the final paragraph of the question, which appears to have virtually nothing to do with anything else in the question, is a little bit bizarre and something I have never ever seen in an exam question since. So let's look at that final paragraph. The company outsourced all legal and company secretarial work to Adam Fleisch, a qualified legal practitioner who worked from home using his own computer. OK, let's just analyse that question then. Um, the company have outsourced something. Well, companies outsource lots of things. And as long as you are getting someone to do it who is qualified, knows what they're doing, generally this is perfectly acceptable. But what they're outsourcing is the legal and company secretarial stuff. So things like maintaining records of directors' interests, shareholders, minutes from the AGM, all the official company paperwork. OK, well, that official company paperwork needs to be available to whoever's auditing you, as they may have to check things, and also is typically something that should be available to the shareholders to look at at any point, should they wish to. Therefore, if you're going to get someone else to maintain these important company records for you, either whoever's doing it needs to be willing to let the auditors and shareholders come to their offices and view the records, or should send copies back to the company whenever anything changes, so that there are copies at, company, at the company which could be looked at. And that's where we've got a bit of a problem. The outsourcing itself is fine, but the problem is that, given what we're about to read, I don't think it's going to be that simple for anyone to look at these documents in the near future. I mean, Adam Fleisch works from home, is he likely to allow the auditors, or in fact anyone, to pop round and look at this stuff in his own house? Given that he works from home, the only sensible solution in this situation is that Adam Fleisch should be sending copies back to Corundum on a regular basis. And look at what the question says now. Adam died suddenly. So there's no point ringing up and asking for copies, or asking to go round and take a look. Corundum does not routinely keep copies of minutes and legal documentation. The problem that we've got here is that Corundum doesn't have all its official paperwork and is now going to struggle to get hold of it in the near future. Bear in mind that when people die, it's typical for lawyers to turn up and spend a little while working out what property in the house belongs to whom. And until that's been dealt with, I very much doubt anyone's going to see anything. Which means, corundum, you could argue, have been unethical in failing to keep copies of their paperwork. It means that whoever is going to audit them may not be able to see that paperwork. And therefore, it could mean that the auditors and shareholders, both of whom have a legal right of access to those documents, may now not be able to complete their work properly. Now, the shareholders could be told you'll have to wait, but if the auditors are trying to finish the audit, maybe they can't finish it. Now, you'll notice that as yet I've not written anything down about this last paragraph, and there's a reason for that. I could write all of this down, but equally the ACCA produce answers, so you can go and look it up. 
I'm not writing it down because this is such a weird last paragraph and it's never come up again that, to be honest, if I saw that on the exam, I'd try and make a quick couple of points, but I'd largely ignore it. It's just weird. And I can't see much benefit in spending longer on it, given it's never been tested since. The key to this question is not the last paragraph. The key is the big chunk in the middle. Break up your answer, talk about what's wrong and what should have happened instead, and you can pass this relatively difficult question relatively easily. So there we go. Two ethics questions done of differing difficulty, and we've not looked at the notes at all. These questions can be answered using the knowledge you already have and some common sense. But do notice in that second question, if you don't understand the situation, you may well think that Scarn have already left and that Newey have already taken over. And that could affect the accuracy of your answer.